Are we going live? We are live. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us um, on this very, very special pre-Christmas um, live stream, this podcast, whatever you want to call it, that's what we're doing. Uh, this evening, we have the wonderful, and I cannot stress this enough, I do think he's one of the best storytellers in the country that I've met at least, uh, Simon Entwistle. Um, the last time he came on, he did uh, Pendo Ghost Witches for us, Pendo Ghost Trials for us, Pendle Ghost Trials? Pendle <laughs> Witch Trials for us. And I've only had one sip of avocado so far, honestly. Um, and it was fantastic. The feedback was phenomenal, absolutely mm -hmm. phenomenal. And of course, we've got my lovely co host, who is uh, Lorian from The Ghost Book, who's looking very festive as well. Um, and I'm sure I just seen our avocado as well. So we're, we're both on a little tipple while we leave Simon to tell you some stories. Um, and yeah, get ready for some festive spook activities. And uh, we should be there. We'll just wait for a few people to come in. Hopefully, we'll see a few more. Um, how are you doing? How is Christmas building up for you, Simon? Is it going well? Well, um, I must say this year has been extremely well organised, mainly because I've got no work, Jane. Um, yeah. All the tours have dried up due to COVID. Um, normally, I'd have coach tours every week. Um, I visit halls and um, visit schools, in fact, uh, for storytelling and... Uh, it's all dried up due to this terrible pandemic, which has caused so much grief to the tourism and indeed um, entertainment industry, really. Yeah, it really has. It really has. And of course, it's not looking any better for next year at the moment, is it? But that's not why we're here uh, this evening. We are here to have some fun. Um, I think we'll get, we've got 14 in. Oh, folks, say hello in the chat. Um, we'd love to hear you. Uh, or show that you're here. I didn't realise we had that many people in. Um, this is a pre-warning. This is not storytelling for children. Um, I don't exactly know what's coming up, but there are some things that probably won't be suitable for children. So if you do have children in the room, now is the time to switch off and go and find another YouTube video. That would be more appropriate. Uh, we, are, we do apologise if this is the case, but we don't want to give your kids nightmares before Christmas um, or nightmares at all. So um, thank you for joining. But if you have to leave, not a problem and we appreciate you coming along and perhaps mum and dad can come back with a tipple and uh yeah you can uh do your little spooky ghost stories after that so thank you so much. we're going to leave it to you we're going to let you start and tell us some christmas stories if we're just sat here with our mouths open it's because we're in awe of your your, your storytelling <laughs> and we're really looking forward to it we, we, we promise we won't get drunk um well i promise i can't say much for Lorien. <laughs> But we, yeah, we're we looking forward to, to what? An hour of storytelling, if, if that. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Jane. Well, folks, we're getting towards Christmas, and uh, Christmas has always been associated with ghost stories. I blame the great Charles Dickens, of course, and the, the famous Christmas Carol. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am a professional tour guide. I conduct a variety of tours, coach tours, walking tours, ghost walks and um i visit a lot of a lot of halls as well really over the years i've um, accumulated a huge amount of ghost stories but i find the best way to get a really good ghost story is to meet an eyewitness account and our very very first story is very much an eyewitness account um it is a ghost story and it is of course associated with christmas eve would you believe but we are going to turn the clock back now to September 1939, when Great Britain declared war on Nazi Germany. Um, territorial units all over Great Britain were um, enlisted and they were sent to France to join what's called the BEF, the British Expeditionary Force. One of them was a young lad called Billy Lakin from Clitheroe in Lancashire. And Billy stood outside St Mary's Church office, the TA Centre in Clitheroe, that September day, with his mates. A photograph was taken. Uh, Bill came to my house and he showed me the photograph. I made him a cup of coffee and the story he told me really made the hair on the back of my head stand up by itself really. He showed me the photograph and on the photograph were 57 young men. On the back of the photograph were, was everyone's name and the word September 1939. They were sent down to the south coast. They made their way across the uh, the English Channel to a place called the Maginot Line, which was held by the French. The Maginot Line were French fortifications, 
And Bill and his platoon members were told by the French the Germans will never, ever get through the Maginot Line. For 10 months, Bill walked up and down the Maginot Line, waving at the Germans. The Germans waved back, and he even bartered British cigarettes for German stew and British bully beef, etc. Uh, this all changed, however, on the 10th of May 1940, when the Germans launched what we call Blitzkrieg, Lightning War. And the French were right, the Germans didn't bother attacking the Maginot Line. They went round the back of it. Bill's platoon commander said, right, boys, we're in trouble. Leave all your equipment. We're going to Dunkirk. Bill mentioned it wasn't exactly a march from the Maginot Line to Dunkirk. It was a run. The Germans were hot on their tail. When they got into Dunkirk, the whole town was ablaze. There was smoke billowing across the water. And as Bill made his way to a sand dune, he sat down and all he could see was over 300,000 British soldiers all waiting to be evacuated. He was so shattered that he fell into a deep sleep. When he woke up some six hours later, he was told by a mate that the German Air Force had been strafing the beach for the last three, three hours. He then met his officer who said, right, boys, it's our turn to be evacuated. In Dover, the Royal Navy have organised what's called Operation Dynamo, where every single small ship was requisitioned, the Alleman Steam Packet Company, uh, the cross-channel ferries, they were all requisitioned to get these boys back. Bill and his platoon made their way down to the water's edge, uh, water lapping around their shoulders, ready to be picked up. When a German aircraft came on the beach, opened fire, Bill died beneath the water. When he came to the surface, the water was crimson red with the blood of his mates. He felt a hand grab his battle dress tunic. He was dragged into a small fishing vessel and then ferried out to a Royal Naval destroyer where he had the finest meal he's ever had, a corned beef sandwich and a mug of tea. Mm -hmm. He got to Dover, he couldn't find any of his mates at all, and an officer said, look, we know where you've come from. You don't need a ticket, get on the next train back to your battalion headquarters, in his case, the St Mary's Parish Church office in Clitheroe, the TA Territorial Army Centre. He got a train from Dover to London, London to Preston, and Preston to Clitheroe. On the journey from Preston to Clitheroe, the train stopped for a while in the railway sidings, and he looked to his left and could see a game of cricket being played. People wearing white flannels. And he thought, this is heaven compared to where I've just come from. He got to the town of Clitheroe. He was just so overjoyed to get back home again. He told me he knelt on the platform and kissed the platform. He then limped all the way to the Territorial Army Centre. He could have gone straight home. When I say limped, he'd worn the boots, the leather off his boots. and was very badly blistered feet. As he opened the door... Out of those 57 young men, only 19 had got back. The rest had been killed or captured. They were told there and then to make it the numbers again to platoon strength. In those days, if you were 18 or 19, whatever, you were conscripted. If you were 17, you could join up, but you did have your mum and dad's consent. Bill was 19. He had a young friend who was 17, and this young boy said, Oh, Bill, go and see me, mum and dad. Get them sign the consent forms. I want to fight for my country. Bill saw this young boy's parents and they said, sorry, he's 17. The war could be over next year anyway. Oh, please, Mum, please, Dad, sign the form. They gave in on one condition, and that condition being that Bill would look after him like a brother. And he swore he would do. So the young lad uh, joined up. He did his training. Then the newly formed platoon was sent to the beautiful Greek island of Crete with the Australian and New Zealand armed forces. On the 21st of May 1941, the Germans launched a highly disciplined airborne invasion on the island of Crete. The British were determined to hold it because had the Germans taken it, they'd have had access to all the Royal Naval bases in North Africa. So it was vital they kept it. The fighting was absolutely ferocious. Uh, the New Zealanders, the Maoris, put up a heck of a fight. But the Germans had total air cover and better equipment. And they took the island. In the fighting, the Clitheroe platoon lost 11 men, one of them being the 17-year-old young lad. Bill was absolutely heartbroken at the death of this young lad and blamed himself entirely. Through his uh, POW camp in Poland for the Red Cross, he wrote letters back to this young boy's parents just simply, please, please forgive me. They wrote back saying, we do not forgive you. We don't blame you for the death of our son. But Bill did. He was repatriated in 1945, came back to his hometown. He was never the same man, never smiled, never joked. 
This poor lad's death haunted him every day. However, things were going to change. On the 24th of December, 1968, Christmas Eve, when he made his way to the parish church office in Clitheroe, the old TA centre, to watch the Clitheroe amateur operate at Christmas play. He was the very, very last person to leave the building. He stood outside and he lit a cigarette. As he smoked the cigarette, he thought of the photograph from the 57 young men against that very wall he was looking at. He took a deep sigh and with his foot, he extinguished the cigarette. He then made his way in front of the building to turn left down a little alleyway, a ginnel, a snickle way. As he turned the corner, he heard three whispers. Hey, Bill. Hey, Bill. Hey, Billy. He turned round and saw the ghost of the young lad in British Army uniform. The first thing Bill noted was this young lad had not aged the day. He looked exactly as he had done on Crete in 1941. The lad rose his arm. Bill, Bill, don't worry about me, Bill. I'm fine, Bill. Don't worry. With that, Billy's knees gave way. He knelt on the cobblestones in that alleyway. And in his own words, he bellowed like a wounded animal. The tears streamed down his cheeks. He almost yelped in pain as he looked at the boy, turned, smiled and vaporised. After a while, Bill slowly got to his feet. He was in a terrible state of trauma. He'd seen something very, very paranormal. He walked home that Christmas Eve past the happy Christmas revellers. But the last thing he felt was celebrating anything. He was deeply upset inside. He got home and climbed into bed and quite surprisingly had the best night's sleep he'd had in years. The following morning, Christmas Day, 1968, he was woken by the bells of St Mary's, the bells of St James and the bells of St Paul's. He got out of bed feeling a lot better, a lot better. He made his way to the bathroom. As he opened the bathroom door, he caught his reflection in the shaving mirror and looked again and again. He saw a change in his facial appearance. He noted for the first time since 1941, he was actually smiling and he felt he'd been truly forgiven for the death of this young boy all those years ago. I will never forget Bill's words as he left my house that day. He said, Simon, I did not believe in ghosts until I saw one with my own eyes. That story came from Bill's heart. Bill died a good 20 years ago. Because I knew him, I felt obligated to go to his funeral. As I sat in the pews at St Paul's Church, the Reverend talked about his life. I then went to the local cemetery to watch the interment. And by the grave were two elderly gentlemen. I had a diplomatic word of both of them. And they said, oh yes, we were captured on Crete with Bill. I mentioned the young lad. Oh yes, oh yes said one of them. Uh, Bill was looking after him. As the Germans got to our positions, Bill sent him back to the ammunition truck to hide behind it. It had a metal tailgate that would offer protection, but a German sniper caught him in open ground. Quite surprisingly, um, my wife and I, we had a holiday in Crete about three years ago, and I went to the Suva Bay Cemetery, uh, the, the Conworth uh, graves there, and I mentioned this young lad's name, and uh, the War Graves Commission people took me straight to the grave. It was quite quite emotional having known the young lad's story. And of course, every November, we always buy poppies. And I always think of these, these lads whose only crime in life was to be born at the wrong time of the last century. And there we have our first story, folks. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Brilliant. That's brilliant. Our next one, we're going to turn the clock back in time to 1874. And a beautiful, beautiful coaching inn uh, in the Ribble Valley, the old west riding of Yorkshire. Uh, the inn is called the Swan Hotel. Now, December the 23rd, 1874, a coach and horses has just arrived in the courtyard. In that coach is a young lad called John T. Martindale. John T. is a cotton trader. His job was to go to Liverpool, watch the ships come in laden with uh, cotton from Louisiana, Mississippi. And he would then uh, distribute the cotton to all the textile factories in Lancashire and Yorkshire. Of course, those two counties, very, very famous for textiles. Inside the coach that day, it was so cold, his coat had nearly frozen to his body. 
as the coach came into the courtyard. He uh, rushed inside the Swan Hotel and felt the warmth from the fire. He met the landlord, John Nicholson, who said, Hey, jaunty lad, you look a little bit jaded. What's the problem, mate? Well, I'm very worried about my wife, actually. She's expecting our first child. And I told her I'd be by her side when she gives birth. Oh, don't worry, lad. The textile barons are upstairs. You nip up now. Take the orders. There's a hot meal for you there, a nice drink for you there. And your horses have just gone round the back to the stable block. They're being fed and watered. Jonty met the textile barons. He took all the orders down, rushed downstairs, ate his meal very quickly and consumed his drink. He then began to pace the, the, the windows downstairs. Where's that coach? I've got to get home. My wife could go, could go into labour any minute. It became dark. As he looked out of the window, he suddenly noticed six horses and a coach. Ah, that's my coach. He rushed outside and climbed on board. Inside the coach, it was very damp, very, very musty. As his eyes became accustomed to the lights, he realised that in there with him were two, two females with long Victorian bonnets. Um, they were slightly disguising their faces. He tried to make a conversation. Uh, excuse me, ladies, uh, would you mind, please, if I just open the window, please? It's not very nice in here. No answer. He could have been talking to two statues. Uh, one lady was sitting next to him, another right in front of him, and the lady in front of him had a baby wrapped in a blanket. They could have been statues. He made another request. Uh, excuse me, ladies, uh, could I please open the window? It's not very nice in here. No answer. The coach judded forward. Uh, made its way out into the village where Jonty made a third and final request. Would you mind if we just open the window, please? No answer. In a fit of rage, he stood up and reached the leather strap attached to the side of the coach window to pull it down. As he pulled it down to his horror, the whole window casing was rotten and came away in his hand. He then heard a scream which shrilled him. He turned to the right and the lady sitting next to him had slowly raised her head to look at him. And where there should have been a face was a hollow, dark cavity. Jonty screamed in terror, fell out of the coach and banged his head. He was knocked unconscious. He came round some five, ten minutes later on the side of the road with a rather nasty head wound. It began to snow quite heavily and a wind whipped up. He made his way back to the Swan Hotel where Nicholson said, Hey, Jonty, where have you been, lad? Let me dress the head wound. Well, I've got in a coach. This woman shed no face. This woman shed a baby. Jonty, calm down, calm down. Your coach is still around the back of the building. Your horse is still being fed and watered. And if you look outside, the snow is so deep and so thick that any coach that arrived here would have definitely made an imprint. Jonty spent the night at the Swan Hotel. The following morning, his coach is ready. He got back to Bromley Cross Bolton in time to witness the birth of his baby daughter. However, he did some research and he found that the uh, Lancaster Manchester coach had left Worley two years previously to make his way to the city of Preston. To get to Preston, it had to go to a place called Geoffrey Hill, uh, a wide expansive road with ravines on either side, which even in the 21st century is rather dangerous. A gust of wind caught the Lancaster Manchester. It blew down the ravine, killing six horses, a driver, an elderly lady, a young woman and her baby. And Jonty was convinced that was the coach she's got into. They say at night time in the village of Worley, when it's really, really quiet, the sound of, a, of galloping horses with a ghostly coach can be heard going through the village, almost like a... A very spooky Christmas story there, folks. Love it. Love it. That's brilliant. <laughs> That's really good. We're now going to make our way to a very, very beautiful hotel called the Duncan House. What a great name, the Duncan House. Um, again, this story comes from Lancashire. And uh, the Duncan House family, they were very, very wealthy. We're going now to the year... Um, 1744, and um, the Duncan House family had eight children. Uh, they were very wealthy landowners, and they wanted their children to be privately schooled. And they were schooled by a very, very beautiful young lady from Paris called Lucette. 
she was a French governess. Uh, she would teach maths, she would teach uh, French, she would teach English. Um, she was a scholar. Um, in um, 1774, a party took place at the Duncan House and uh, a very, very handsome red-coated British army officer of the name of John Starkey arrived. Uh, as he made his way inside the, the beautiful Duncan House residence, he was given a glass of claret. There was an orchestra playing in the corner of the, the ballroom and he glanced and saw Lucette. It was literally love at first sight. And the feeling was quite mutual from Lucette to him. Within four months, they'd struck up a very, very close relationship and they married with the full consent of the Duncan Halsh family. At that period of time, our cousins in America were getting a little bit restless and they made a declaration of independence. The British government were not at all impressed by this and they sent every available British soldier to North America, including Lieutenant John Starkey of the Blues and Rolls Household Cavalry. Now, of course, in those days, you couldn't have a telephone, you, there were no radios. You relied entirely on letters which took a long, long time to arrive. Um, shortly after the, uh, the left hand had left these shores, uh, Lucette found to her much happiness that she was indeed carrying his child. She was delighted. Uh, she did write to him, but no letters came back. Word filtered. Uh, you could see really, I suppose, um, ideas and notions filtered back from America that he'd been killed at Lexington. She received this letter on Christmas Eve. 1777. The poor girl was heavily pregnant. She'd been more or less informed that her husband had been killed and she was overcome, overcome with grief. She made her way down the long driveway of the Duncan House residence to a river called the River Calder. There, in a moment of grief, she stood on top of the little bridge there and she dived into the cold, icy waters of the River Calder. Her frozen body was found the day later, Christmas Day, uh, halfway down the river. And what makes this story so terribly, terribly sad is the lieutenant had not been killed. He'd been captured and he'd been released and got home on Christmas Day, the day after his wife had taken her life. He too was so overcome with grief that he too made his way to that bridge over the River Calder and dived into the cold, icy waters. Now, Lucette's ghost has been seen by quite a few people, but only around the Christmas period. And if any of you would like to go onto the internet, look up the Duncan Halsh Hotel, which is situated at a place called Clayton in Lancashire. Very, very beautiful, beautiful building. And um, quite a few paranormal investigators have gone there around the Christmas period to try and see Lucette. And uh, I do know that in 1937, she had a real encounter with a member of staff there. And uh, this member of staff actually wrote a book relating to her. And uh, he was definitely believed because she was wearing clothing from that period of time. But it's a very tragic, yet sadly, a very, very true story. As indeed is our next one. And this is one of my favourites. Uh, we are going to make our way now to uh, South Cumbria and uh, a gentleman called John Padstow. And I do apologise if you've heard this one before, Jane, but it, it is indeed a Christmas story. Uh, John Padstow worked for the Central News Agency in London in the uh, late 1800s. He was a stickler for being on time for absolutely everything. Uh, when he had a holiday, he would do what's called a walking holiday. Some people do that to this very, very day, actually, don't they? And um, he would meticulously plan his journeys on foot. He would get a map of the area. He would then write to local inns and local B&Bs and hostelries. And he would tell them what time he'd arrive and he'd pre-book his place. He set off from the market town of Penrith in Cumberland, walked down towards Kendall in Westmond. And his destination was a, a lovely old inn called the Bluebell in the village of Heversham in South Lakeland. 
he had perhaps underestimated the time it would take him to get to the Bluebell because as he made his way to a place called Hevisham Head, this huge limestone outcrop with a forest over the top of it, um, it was just going dark. He started to make his ascent up the mountain road through the forest twisting pathways and up in the top of the forest was a farm called Mabin Hall, which is still there to this very, very day. It became very dark. The moon came out and the moon illuminated uh, through the tree line above his head. Little parts of the road, which helped him a lot, really. As he came around the corner past Mabin Hall, there was a slight dip. And he saw what he thought was a sheep, just in the middle of the road. He walked towards what he thought was a sheep and found it was not a sheep, but a young lady in a nightdress. She was sitting in a puddle of water, just combing her hair. Uh, can I help you, said Pastor. Can I help you? There was no answer. In fact, he suddenly realised that she didn't even know he was there. And he realised he was looking at something from the next world. He got a bit of a pace on, ran a hundred yards away and turned. And he thought he heard on the, on, on the wind the words, Oh, when, when, when will he arrive? He then rushed down into the village of Hebersham and booked into the Bluebell Hotel. Quite surprisingly, he didn't tell anyone. Um, he didn't tell anyone at all. He didn't tell his family, he didn't tell relatives, and he certainly didn't tell anyone in the Bluebell Hotel. But when he got back to London, he often thought about that encounter. And six years later, he thought, I'm going to redo that walk. He chose the same hostilities again and made his way uh, towards Hevisham Head and past Mabin Hall, and there was nothing there in the road this time. He then made his way down into the Bluebell at Hevisham and walked up to the bar and booked him for the night and told the landlord what had happened to him six years previously. The landlord was just drawing a beer glass. The beer glass slipped through his fingers and smashed in the floor. Hey, lad, it sounds like you've seen the ghost of Jane Gill. Jane Gill? Tell me about her. I will, lad. Well, we're looking at the 1830s here, but uh, Jane Gill was a very, very beautiful young lady. She was the toast of, of the area. There were lads queuing up just to marry her, but she only had eyes for one man, and that man was called Ambrose Brown, who lived in the little village of Hincaster, not too far from Mabin Hall. I remember many lads coming to this pub and saying, I'd like to crack that Michael Brown's skull. He's got the most beautiful girl in the whole area. Well, he not only... Uh, uh, had the most beautiful girl in the area, he was going to marry her on Christmas Day, 1853, at St. Peter's Church in the village of Hebersham. Um, there was a lot of jealousy, and uh, Michael was not particularly uh, well-liked because he had got the bell of the ball, if you will. Two days before Christmas Eve, Michael's horse was found wandering the fields around Mabin Hall Farm, and Michael's body was found on the road with some very, very serious cranial injuries. The doctor arrived and pronounced uh, his death, but was quite shocked to said these injuries do not look like they've happened. Um, uh, consistent of falling from a horse. I think someone's attacked him, but we can't prove it. So, death by misadventure. Now, Mr Gill, Jane's father, was told immediately, but he just could not break the news to his daughter. He just couldn't. On the day of the wedding, which was Christmas Day, she put her wedding dress on and she was so excited at the prospect of marrying Ambrose. She was elated with happiness. However, she said, Father, I've not heard from Ambrose. What's happened to him? What's... I've not heard from him. He, he must be going to the church, surely. That's when her father told her what had happened. The poor girl screamed and screamed. Her heart had been snapped in two. She rushed out of the, the farm building, down the little track. Her father was about to pursue her when her mother said, no, 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 let her let off steam. She needs to be by herself. Well, that night, she didn't come in. And Christmas Day morning, she was found in a pool of water, rainwater, at the area where John Padstow had first come across her. It seems that John Padstow had come across the ghost of Jane Gill whose only crime in life was to be a very beautiful young lady who met a local lad who everyone was jealous of. Thank you. Wow. Our next story is, um, you could say, quite a modern 
ghost story, really. And we are going to make our way to the town of Blackburn. And way back in 1906 in Blackburn was a huge, huge theatre called Trevanian's Amphitheatre. Uh, in the 1930s, it was, it was renamed the Grand Cinema. In 1957, it was bought by a gentleman called William John Murray. And uh, John Murray uh, wanted to turn the cinema back into a fantastic, beautiful theatre. He did do but it was competing against a brand new piece of equipment called the television set. Um, he put in a show for the very, very last time, which was a very apt show, really, called A Farewell to Blackburn. As the curtains closed for the very, very last time, he burst into tears. His dream was shattered. He was also heavily, heavily in debt. He made his way to the green room. He opened the drawer of his bureau desk, and brought out a 45 service Colt revolver. He loaded the weapon and placed the bow to his temple and sadly pulled the trigger. For three long years, the old theatre was left unoccupied. Holes appeared in the ceiling. Vagrants broke in. There was the odd fire. And word spread around the town of Blackburn that the old theatre was haunted. In 1961, the General Post Office took an interest in the theatre, not to reopen it, but to knock it down and build a telephone exchange on that very, very site, which they have done. And our next story is very much about the people that worked in the telephone exchange building. When it was opened in the 1960s, you had what's called switchboard operators, people that wore headsets and put jack plugs into various areas and sockets to divert calls around the town. Jeff Hutchinson, Bert Greer and Tom Cotton worked on the night shift and their very very first night was heading towards Christmas 1961. Um, the paint was still fresh, the equipment was spanking brand new and they worked on the top floor on the uh, consoles. Right in front of them were plate glass windows that led right down to the cafeteria where they could go for a cup of tea etc. Around three o'clock in the morning it became very quiet, the calls became a bit more fainter and Jeff said to his two colleagues, I think I'll make a cup of tea, lads. Now, Jeff wore a brogue shoe with a heel plate and a toe plate. And uh, he made his way uh, towards the end of the telephone exchange building, put the kettle on, got the, the three cups, the milk and the sugar. But he felt he was being watched. Strange enough, back at the, uh, the control columns, uh, Bert and Tom could still hear his footsteps but he was still standing completely still. A shrill atmosphere filled the top floor. Um, Jeff came back with the tray with the tea and the sugar and the and the three cups. Uh, what's wrong, lads? You look a bit sheepish. Well, said Tom, uh, we saw you making the tea, but we could actually hear your footsteps. No, impossible. Although I did feel I was being watched, I must admit. All of a sudden, the Belisha blinds went up and down, and they all heard the sound of a grand piano um, playing the Blue Danube. They checked all six floors. The sound of the music didn't get any louder, but it didn't get any quieter either. They checked all the floors, but to no avail. This happened not every night, but at least once a week. However, Christmas of that year was going to be the most spookiest time they ever, ever had. They booked on as usual for Christmas Eve. Went on the lift, top floor, headsets on, plugging in calls all around the area. Where for the very first time, they heard the lift working by itself. Jeff was a bit braver. He had his um, umbrella. He waited for the doors to open to pounce on his victim. But as the doors opened, there was absolutely nothing there. The three of them then heard hysterical laughing coming from downstairs. They got in the lift, went down to the bottom floor. As the lift doors opened, they saw the Christmas tree shaking wildly by itself. All the baubles fell to the floor. The tree bent back and... And then there was silence. Word got round the town of Blackburn what had been happening. And a local author called Bob Dobson wrote a book called The Blackburn Teleghost. Who is the Blackburn Teleghost? None other than Mr William J Murray, who loved that building so much, 
he couldn't bear to leave it. And to this very, very day, the old building, which is now full of modernised equipment, is still haunted by the telly ghost. Quite a beautiful story, that one, I thought, really, yeah. Yeah, that one's good, that one. <clears throat> Definitely. Our next one is um, one of my favourites again. Um, one, one thing I really do love, actually, is the British pub. And our public houses in Great Britain date right back, some of them, to the 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th century. In fact, in Stratford and Avon, you've got the Garrick, which is made entirely of wood, and that dates back to the time of, of Shakespeare. But uh, the one inn I really do love, and I do tours there quite often, is a gorgeous old inn called the De Lacey Arms. And we're going to talk about the actual area, first of all. Uh, the De Lacey Arms uh, was built on the foundations of a gorgeous building called the Manor House. The Manor House uh, was knocked down in the year 1850 and the foundations were left there and they just built this public house on top of it, on top of the foundations uh, called the De Lacey Arms. To this very day, you can make your way to the snug bar, put your ear to the floor and there you'll hear the sound of rushing water because underneath the, uh, the snug bar is indeed a well. They just put floorboards across it and built on top of it. Now, the landlord was a, a marvellous chap called uh, Phil. Uh, Phil has now left, actually, for, for obvious reasons, as you'll find out. But Phil used to get really, really annoyed, particularly on a Saturday and Sunday when they were very busy, when his beer pumps ran dry. He would rush down to the cellar and find that someone had unplugged all the pipes to the barrels. He got really annoyed with his staff and thought, right, I'll, I'm going to get a lock, lock the, the, the cellar door, and I'll be the only person who's got the keys. But it happened again in a fit of temper. He unlocked the cellar door, went down, and found the pipes being pulled off. He put them all back on again, and then he heard a humming noise that got louder and louder and louder. He turned and saw a monk in a white habit walking straight towards him. Uh, Phil was horrified. In fact, he even screamed. He rushed past the phantom, rushed upstairs into the snug bar where there were three elderly gentlemen enjoying a pint. He told them, they laughed. Oh, don't worry, Phil, don't worry. You've seen the Cistercian monk. He's been haunting this area for years. Not too far from the De Lacey Arms is the old abbey that was um, knocked down in the 18, so in the, uh, the 1530s. And there's a tunnel that leads underneath the old abbey, right underneath the De Lacey Arms, right to a place called the Nab, which is a, a little rocky outlet quite near there, really. But as it happened, Phil saw him on three occasions and realised he was actually not really harmful, really. And in some cases, he would actually say good morning to him when he actually saw him. Um, in 1996, uh, Phil and his wife and three kids deserved a holiday and they went to Ibiza in the Balearic Islands. He contacted the brewery and they sent a young lad from the city of Liverpool, a relief manager. And Phil said, uh, now the building is haunted, but don't worry, the ghost won't harm you. The reply was, eh, sorry, mate, I don't believe in ghosts, actually. Well, suit yourself, said Phil. That night, this young lad uh, climbed into bed. He had two Alsatian dogs with him, and the dogs started barking hysterically. He opened his eyes, and there at the end of the bed was our Cistercian monk. No, don't hurt me. The boss is coming back next week. Don't hurt me. With that, the figure turned and went straight out of the wall. That lad got dressed immediately, packed his cases, and couldn't wait to see the liver buildings once again. However, it was Boxing Day, um, 1997, that really upset Phil and his wife. They had lots of Christmas cards behind the bar with blue tack. And um, Phil's wife, uh, Jane, looked up and to a horror saw the cards being plucked off the back of the bar by an invisible hand. And that was the final straw. They thought, I think it's about time we made our way away, really. But I've done quite a lot of research on the area and uh, Worley Abbey is very, very near there. And there is a, a story of a, a young girl 
uh, known simply as the White Lady of the Sands. And um, there's a book called The Window on Warley by the late James Fell. And he mentions that not all the monks were gentlemen, apparently. Uh, of course, they were there for religious study. Uh, the monks would survive by buying raw materials off local people. They'd turn those raw materials into alcohol, into, into clothing, into furniture, etc. But of course, they had to, they had a religious uh, cult, of course. It, it was said that a nun was helping with religious studies. Quite a beautiful young girl, by all accounts. And she'd been abused by one or two of the monks and she tried to escape. The monks very, very kindly repaid her by murdering the poor girl and burying her in the grounds of the abbey. Now, the, um, in 1536, the King Henry VIII outlawed the Roman Catholic faith and the abbey uh, became the property of the crown and a lot of the walls were knocked down and um, a lot of housing in the 21st century is built right next to it. And I received a telephone call from a lady who uh, lived very, very near the ground of Warley Abbey. And she said, Simon, I've got a real story for you. I went round to see her. She made me a, a nice cup of coffee. And she said that she was sitting on the end of the bed in August. And she opened her eyes and there she saw a very, very beautiful young lady with blonde hair and blue eyes. And she had um, what looked like a, a gorgeous white dress on. Uh, she elegantly dipped her head and then she disappeared. She thought, I've been drinking. But she thought, no, I don't touch alcohol all week, you know, just at weekends, really. She saw the figure about five times over the next next two years and was never scared, just a bit shocked, really. So therefore, she put the house up for sale. She was actually a dentist and um, she travelled to Manchester every day, which is quite a long journey, really. And she needed to get nearer to Manchester. So therefore, she sold the house and Houses are sold very, very quickly there. It's a very, very nice place to live, really. So she sold the house, and then uh, three days later, she went back because she'd forgotten a present from her mother-in-law, would you believe, which is a garden hose. When she drove back, she met the new family that had moved in, who were all ashen-faced and very, very tired. She said, um, what's wrong? Well, you know, it's all the house was haunted. What, do you, what have you seen? Upstairs. There's a young woman in the corner with blue hair, blue eyes and long blonde hair. Thank you, she said. I thought I was seeing things. The um, book, The Window on Warley, covers this young lady, the, the nun that was murdered. And many people believe that she is actually buried in the garden of this new house, which would have been inside the original walls. But a very, very touching story. Um, I got a call from Melbourne, Australia, a few years ago, from a, a young lad whose mum and dad had emigrated in the 1950s and they'd told him all about the white lady of, of the of the sands Warley and um, he asked me if I could take him on a guided tour which I did do on Boxing Day would you believe Boxing Day night because it comes such a long way I felt I had to make the effort really and um, I gave him a complete tour of the village and we went to this area but sadly the white lady of the sands did not did not make an appearance but I did get a call from a local police officer who told me that um, at that period of time, the 1970s, they'd had a lot of um, burglars on that area and they'd up the police patrols at night time by using panda cars. And he drove his panda car down the avenue near the old abbey, looked in the rearview mirror and there he saw a figure in a white, white dress. And he thought, that's strange, it's half past three in the morning. Who in the right mind would be there? So he um, got out of the vehicle. There was no one there at all. He walked to the airway, he'd seen her, no one there at all. He then got back to his vehicle and looked to the ignition on, looked to the rearview mirror, and this young girl's face was at the very, very back window, staring at him. He shrieked in terror. First gear, second gear, third gear, drove right round the back of the village, back to the village Bobby, the police station, where he told the sergeant, and the sergeant said, Right, lad, looks like you've seen the Lady of the Sands. She's been here since 1536. But it's um, quite a touching story, and again, with a with a Christmas flavour, really. That's amazing. Are we ready for another one, folks? We are, yeah. Have you, have you got the, the capacity in your voice to carry on? Oh, I have, dear. I have. Yeah, that's all right. Indeed. That's good. Um, we'll, I have we'll, indeed. We'll it, listen, uh, as long as you want to tell. Okay, my love. <laughs> Uh, this next one is, 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 again, it's a very, very beautiful story, really. 
and we're going to turn the clock back now to 1955 and a Royal Air Force base called Gutteslau in Germany. Uh, at that period of time, of course, it was the height of the Cold War and the Royal Air Force and the United States Eighth Army Air Force were always based in Germany because they expected the invasion. Had it ever happened, it would have taken place there with the old Soviet Union. Um, Lieutenant John Hanne, Royal Air Force, had got permission to fly back to Lincolnshire, his base in Lincolnshire, to be with his family Christmas. And he had what's called a vampire jet. Um, he got permission to take off from air traffic control. And around Gutterslau, there's a lot of fog. And as he took off down the runway, he took the aircraft up, 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 but into deep, deep fog. Uh, although this was the 1950s, it was still quite dangerous to fly in such conditions. He had his navigation equipment with him. He had his compass with him. And he kept glancing down from the cockpit to get a bearing to get back to Lincolnshire over the North Sea. He looked at the fuel gauge and knew he had enough fuel to get there because his, uh, his team back at Gutterslau had made sure that the fuel tanks were full. However, he became disorientated and he couldn't find a bearing. He began to sweat quite, uh, quite profusely in the cockpit. He thought, I've got this expensive aircraft. I can't just jump out. Uh, it, it could crash in a primary school. It could hit a town. I've got to get back to Lincolnshire, at least to the sea anyway. Um, he came down from the cloud and found an open space. And then, as he glanced through the cockpit, he saw an aircraft that seemed to be swinging its wing, uh, almost trying to get his attention. As he looked quite closely, the aircraft was a World War II de Havilland Mosquito. What's that doing here, he thought. The RAF don't use those anymore. He could make out quite clearly a pilot uh, at the controls and the pilot seemed to wave with his finger, telling him to follow him. He brought the vampire's speed down to the same speed as the mosquito and followed the mosquito uh, right across the North Sea. Uh, the mosquito, of course, was flying at full power and he kept just behind it. He tried to make radio contact with the aircraft, but to no avail whatsoever. In the far distance, he could make out the North Sea. The mosquito then banked and disappeared. But before it disappeared, the pilot just pointed for the perspex glass. And uh, Hanne took the aircraft straight to its base in Lincolnshire. He landed with literally a cup, a cup full of fuel in the tank. He made his way straight to the debriefing room and told his commanding officer, Oh, I want to thank that mosquito pilot. Without him, I would never have got back. The fog was terrible. Mosquito pilot, said his wing commander. Yes, uh, uh, halfway across the sea, I, was, I emerged from fog and there was the mosquito. He was right there. The pilot was waving furiously from the cockpit to follow, to follow. There's been no mosquito. We don't have any in the Royal Air Force. There's no private collection. And um, that aircraft would have no navigation equipment at all to get over the, the sea for those conditions. I swear to you, I swear to you, I have indeed seen this mosquito. It brought me back. Well, they checked the black box on the aircraft. And uh, there was a mysterious voice on the, uh, the black box from a Lieutenant John Royland who'd been shot down over Dusseldorf in 1943 as a pathfinder in a mosquito. And the hair on the back of his head rose quite high. Very touching Christmas story once again, folks. I love that one. That one just gave me shivers, yeah. <laughs> that was good. Very good. Um, our next one, we're going to go to Christmas Eve, 1642. Um, in 1642... Um, this country was at war with itself. It was called the Civil War. It was brought about by Parliament having a dispute with the King. Now, King Charles I ran the country. His word was final. He would organise everything, and Parliament, of course, could propose it, but it had to go through him. And all of a sudden, Parliament said, Sir, we think it's about time this country was run by the people. Not by you, sir. What? I run this country, 
said the king. Sir, we shall fight you for the right to rule this country, and the loser will lose their head. The king was quite annoyed. He formed his own army, and they were called royalists. Parliament formed their own army, and they were called parliamentarians, commonly known as roundheads and cavaliers. In some case, brother fought brother, uh, family fought family. Uh, you were either loyal to the crown or loyal to parliament. In the beautiful uh, town of Preston, uh, you'll find a hall there called Horton Towers. Gilbert de Horton was a very, very wealthy man. He wrote to King Charles, Sir, I shall form an army, sir. I will take Blackburn, Burnley, Nelson, Cone, Clitheroe for New Year's Day, sir. The, your royal standard will be flying above all of them, sir. I shall form a huge army. And he did do a huge army, all loyal to the king. They set off. They were all extremely well equipped, had the finest clothes to wear, brand new cannon, excellent cavalry. And they made their way to a place called Duke's Brow, which overlooks the town of Blackburn. There they got their cannon on top of Duke's Brow and they opened fire and cannonball after cannonball came raining down into the town of Blackburn. In the town itself were two parliamentarian officers, um, Colonel Starkey and Colonel Shuttleworth. And they told their men, keep your heads down, boys. We can expect an infantry attack at any minute. However, the cannon stopped firing on top of Duke's brow. And there was a huge argument taking place with Horton and his men. Sir, we don't mind dying for you, sir. We certainly do not mind dying for the king, sir. But it's Christmas Eve. We should be with our families. Look, attack Blackburn now. I've paid you. You've all been paid. You've got the finest equipment in the country. Take Blackburn now. They refused. The main bulk of the army about turned. Sir, we should be with our families. It's Christmas Eve, sir. Horton was furious. A small detachment of his men did stay on top of Duke's brow. But in the, t in the trenches in Blackburn, uh, both Starkey and Shuttle thought, hey, they're retreating. They're retreating. We can catch them at the top of Duke's brow. And an engagement took place there. Quite a huge engagement, actually. Uh, quite a few casualties on both sides. However, Horton left all his equipment, which was captured by the parliamentarian forces. We now pick up the story in 1995 and a beautiful, beautiful hot summer's day when um, a lady who lived on top of Duke's Brow owned a very, very beautiful house. Seven rooms, gorgeous house. Uh, she was actually born in that house. She had seven children who had all left home. And she said to her husband, let's open a bed and breakfast. And they did do. Doing very, very well. Extremely well, really. There they'd have guests from all over the world that came to see relatives or just wanted um, accommodation. In 1995, lovely hot summer's day, she made her way to the vegetable patch and she placed her fork into the soil and turned the soil over. Up came a cannonball. Up came a broken spear. Up came some shrapnel. Now, she knew all about the Battle of Duke's Brow. She'd heard about it, but it probably took place in her back garden. She had no idea. She placed the items in a seed tray and then placed those items um, near the kitchen sink. The telephone rang as it did on many, many occasions, and she picked the phone up. On the end of the phone was an Australian chap. Uh, hello there, have you got a, a riff? My wife and three kids were going to come over the Sarvo. Oh, yes, of course I have. Righty hand, see you later. The Australian family arrived. Mum, Dad, three daughters. Oh, just go to the front room. I'll make you a nice cup of tea and then I shall take you to your bedrooms. She put the kettle on and then she heard hysterical shouting and screaming. The Australian family came rushing down the corridor, elbowed her out of the way. What's wrong? What's wrong? They wouldn't answer. They got in their car and they drove off the driveway without saying a word. Quite naturally, she was deeply upset. Oh no, has my cat made a mess in there? She went into the room there and found the settee on its side. 
lampshade on the floor and a painting hanging very awkwardly. She told the husband. The husband said, oh, don't worry, love. Australians, very strange people. But she was upset. She really was. She, she was deeply upset. That night, the telephone rang again. And on the end of the telephone was an Australian, the same Australian, who was now in South Cumbria at a place called Grasmere. Uh, so sorry about leaving your house in such a hurry. I should think so. What was the problem? Ah, oh, my wife's just got over it. What do you mean your wife's just got over it? Ah, oh, these soldiers came for the war. Right for the war. Right for my wife and three kids. Soldiers, yeah. Goaty beards, red jackets. Right for my wife and three kids. Well, thanks for telling me, she said. It wasn't long before the story got into the local newspaper. It wasn't long before the Daily Mail arrived and they sat down with this lady and had an interview with her and the story was published to the entire nation. That's when two professors from York University arrived to see her. She made them a cup of tea and they said, what's happened to you, my love? You've had Martindale syndrome. What do you mean Martindale syndrome, she said. Right. In 1952, behind York Minster, working deep in the cellar behind York Minster in a place called the Treasurer's House, was a young lad called Harry Martindale. Harry was an apprentice um, plumber. He was installing central heating. He had a blowtorch to soften the pipes, to bend the pipes. He was screwing the pipes into the wall of the cellar. As you can imagine, you've got a brick wall here, brick wall there and a roof over your head. He heard the sound of a trumpet that seemed to get louder and louder. He then glanced to the right and out of the wall appeared a horse, a white horse, with a Roman soldier on the back of it, followed by platoon after platoon of infantry. Harry came down the ladder and scuttled in fear into the corner of the cellar as he watched these ghostly phantoms come out of the wall. It lasted for a good two minutes. He had time to look at their clothing. He noticed they were all very, very thin, very, very emaciated, and they all looked to be deeply, deeply depressed. He also noticed he could only see them to their knees. As the last Roman soldier went past, he heard the sound of the trumpet fade into the distance. He swallowed deeply, rushed up the stairs, and told his boss. His boss said, oh no, Harry, no, 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 no. We've got a contract, lad. You've got to get this job finished. Come on, we've got to get this job finished. I can't go back down there again, said Harry. I'm sorry, lad, you're sacked. He lost his job. He made his way through the streets of York to a beautiful old inn called the Old Star Inn. At the bar, he met a young lad from the York Evening Press, whose words were, Hey, mate, you look like you've just seen a ghost. Actually, I've uh, I've seen about 95 this afternoon. Oh, yeah. Tell me about it, then. Getting towards Halloween. He did do. The York Evening Press journalist said, Hey, lad, it's getting towards Halloween. It sounds like a grand story. I'm going to post it. I'm going to print it. They did do. Well, the whole city of York laughed at young Harry Martindale. He was the butt of many, many a joke. However, some two weeks later, some more soil had to be removed from the treasurer's house cellar. They found the area where Harry had seen his Roman soldiers. It was a beautiful, preserved Roman road. And they found Roman tablets, stone tablets, the words Eberarchum. They had found the very, very garrison of York, Eberarchum. That's when the uh, professors from York University sat with him, talked to him, and he explained what they'd been wearing. He said they did not look like Hollywood Roman soldiers. These men were wearing what looked like a leather kilt, round shield, a round skull cap, uh, very slightly dark skinned and very emaciated. They believe that what Harry saw with his blowtorch and his soldering irons, he'd somehow opened a time warp to another era, another time, and those Roman soldiers could have just been the ninth Hispanic Legion leaving the city of York for Carlisle, where they were wiped out to a man. Beautiful, beautiful story, that one. It really is.
Amazing. The comments coming in for you are absolutely incredible, Simon. Oh, lovely. People are loving it. Well, that's nice. That's really nice. Good. Good. If, if you want to carry on, you're more than welcome to. If you, if you want to oh. end it there. Oh, no, 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 Jane. It's it's um, if people are enjoying it, then it makes it all worthwhile, really. Um, I wonder if we can just give, give your voice a quick break and we'll see if we can come up with some of these comments for you to see. Okay, uh, there we go. There's one Aunt Deb Simon. You're truly a brilliant sto storyteller. I can envision being wherever you speak of, uh, like reading a, a good book, only better. That's very kind, very kind. There's uh, brilliant tales. Oh, lovely. I've been forgetting to read the comments. I'm too engrossed. <laughs> uh, totally engrossed with Simon's stories. This has been a special treat for us all from Joanna as well. That's uh, very nice. There's lots that. of comments, so thank you very much. There we go. There's another one. Simon has such a soothing voice. Would listen to his stories all evening. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I think we, we you just you just shadow everything that we want to say. So thank you for doing this. Um, Whenever you're ready to continue, we're ready to listen. Very good. Um, this is another quite touching Christmas Day story, actually. It's quite a quite a touching one, really. And we're going to make our way up to a town called Penrith in um, in Cumberland. Uh, in World War One in Penrith, there was a very, very large military hospital, which not only looked after British and Commonwealth troops, but also German uh, German troops that have been badly injured as well, really. And this is the story of a young Australian sergeant of the name of James Mercer. And James was a sergeant in the Australian Light Horse. He'd been sent to a horrible place called Gallipoli. Um, just that one word sends a shiver down the back of most Australians to this very day because they lost a lot of men and they blamed the British entirely for what was really a huge military cock-up. Not only Australian boys lost their lives there, but a lot of British and New Zealand boys as well, really. Um, Sergeant Mercer was wounded quite badly by shrapnel in his back. He was taken down the beach at Gallipoli and placed on a hospital ship and was sent straight to England. Um, his wounds were so bad that they had to be dressed every day. Now, in 1915, they didn't have any antibiotics, so these wounds had to be dressed every single day. And, of course, he couldn't line his back. He had to line his front. In Penrith, uh, being a sergeant, he was given his own room, and um, one of the nurses took a real shine to him. She felt real pity on him, and uh, she was called uh, Jean Trainer. Jean was a staff nurse, about the same age as the sergeant, actually. And she did take a shine to him. And, of course, every night um, she would clean his wounds and put fresh dressings on. She got to know him very well, and she would sit next to his bed and read stories to him. And she took a real a real um, heart affection towards him. The sergeant also thought a lot of her, although there's just one problem. He was indeed married. Um, now... Um, she knew that he was actually very, very ill and wasn't eating very well. And the wounds in his back were so deep that not all the shrapnel had been taken out. And she knew deep down that he wasn't going to live very much longer. Um, on Christmas um, Day evening, around five o'clock in the evening, she dressed the wounds and went to the next ward to do the same to other patients. And she just came back and as she walked past his room, she saw an elderly gentleman sitting at the end of the bed. And she thought, she just, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't realise you had a guest with a sergeant. I'll, I'll come back later on. She went back to the, um, the main canteen and there was the evening duty matron. And uh, the matron said, have you um, changed Sergeant Chase's uh, wounds? Well, I couldn't. There was a man with him, actually, a, a, a guest. What? A guest at this time of night? There's no Davis. There's no visit allowed after five o'clock. Uh, tell him to go. Go back and tell him to go. As she went back to the room, she found that poor Sergeant Chase had died. There was no one with him. And she had the terribly sad job of placing him in a white sheet for burial. She also opened his locker 
and she found his wallet, his pay book. As she picked the wallet up, it slipped through her fingers and fell to the floor, and a photograph popped out. She noticed on the photograph it was the same gentleman sitting at the end of the bed, and this was Sergeant Chase's father. She never, ever forgot that Christmas day. It's a rather beautiful but touching story once again, really. Um, one place I really do like visiting uh, is a hall called Sarsby Hall. Um, I do a lot of tours uh, in cities on streets, etc. And you've got to compete against cars. But to go to a hall, a lovely historic hall, and take groups with you is fantastic because you don't need to worry about the weather and you don't need to worry about the sound of cars, etc. Sarsby Hall is a national treasure. You will find it on the internet, folks, under just Salmsby Hall. And on YouTube, I do have a, um, a, a, a full section of stories relating to Salmsby Hall, which if you'd want to, you can have a look later on, really. But I would like to bring out, again, another very, very beautiful, touching story of a lady called Dorothea Southworth. Uh, Dorothea's only crime in life was to be born into a Catholic family, as indeed all the Southworths were, really. She lived in the hall uh, in the 15, 1530s. On a beautiful, beautiful summer's day, uh, she made her way across the manicured lawns of Sarsby Hall, over the moat and into the forest. In the forest, she came across a handsome young lad called Gilbert D. Horton from Horton Towers, the same place we've just been talking about. Um, he... Uh, Young Dee Horton looked into her eyes and it was love at first sight. The feeling was very, very mutual. They um, arranged to meet each other again. Dorothea made her way back to the hall and told her father. He was absolutely furious. We are Catholics. They are Protestants. You will never, ever, ever, ever see him again. If you do, I'll have you sent to the, the nunnery in Marseille. We are Catholics. She will never have my permission. Take your hand in marriage. If anything, this fueled their love. In the dead of night, she would leave her bed, tiptoe past her sleeping parents and sleeping brothers, over the moat and into the forest. Her father warned her again. If you continue with this relationship, I promise you, I'll have you sent to Marseille to live with the nuns. We are Catholics. They are Protestants. He will never stain our family traditions of Catholicism. He then told her two brothers. Tonight, boys, do what's necessary. On a beautiful, beautiful moonlit night, she left her bed. It was Christmas Eve. She left her bed. She tipped her past her sleeping brothers and indeed her sleeping parents. Made her way across the manicured lawns, over the moat, towards the forest. There on the fringe of the forest that was shining with deep, deep frost, was young Dee Horton. When he saw her, he very, very politely bowed. He affectionately kissed her hand, reached into his pocket and produced a huge, huge engagement ring. Oh, Dorothy, Dorothy, will you end this heartache and become my wife? A huge smile came across her face and she gratefully, gratefully accepted the proposal. They hugged each other in the moonlight. And then they heard the sound of shouting. And out of the forest appeared Dorothea's two brothers, both of them armed with two sharp knives. They viciously, viciously murdered the poor boy right in front of her. Dorothea's heart was snapped in two. The poor girl was dragged back into the hall and she was placed under house arrest. The following morning, she made the long, long journey to Marseille to live with the nuns. On arriving there, that poor girl never ate again. She never slept again. She never drank again. And she died literally of a broken heart. That's when the famous sightings of the White Lady Sansby have appeared. Always in between the horse chestnuts and the yew tree, and occasionally in the main hall. There have been many, many, many sightings. And I'm going to choose just two sightings, and we'll turn the clock back now to the 1870s. In fact, 1878. 
when in nearby Preston, nearby Blackburn, we had what's called textile writing. And uh, the army were called in. And the unit chosen to look after that area was none other than the 24th Regiment of Fort South Wales Borders and the command of Lieutenant Colonel John Pauline. Uh, the colonel toast the regiment. Uh, right, gentlemen, we shall retire for the evening. He climbed into his uh, bed and fell into a deep sleep. In the early hours of the morning, he was woken by the sound of sobbing. That's strange. Sounds like uh, a female to me, not one of my men. He opened the curtains and looked out into the, uh, into the courtyard. And there, in between the horse chestnut and the yew tree, he saw a young lady with a, a white robe on, in distress being an officer and a gentleman. He got dressed very quickly and he rushed across the lawns and shouted, Ma'am, Ma'am, may I be of assistance to you, Ma'am? The figure slowly turned and where there should have been a face was a hollow, dark cavity. The colonel screamed. He was no coward. He'd taken the life of many a Russian soldier in the Crimean Wars, but he was horrified. He rushed back into the building, ran upstairs and reached for his British Army regulation hip flask and consumed the contents. The following morning he had breakfast with the Harrison family. They laughed. Oh, Colonel, don't worry. You've seen the white lady, Lady Dorothea Southworth. She's been with us since the 1530s. The Colonel had no idea. He was going to meet her personally when his regiment, the 24th, was sent to South Africa, where they joined Lord Chelsea's ill-fated number three column and invaded Zululand. And there, on the 22nd of January, 1879, beneath a rocky outlook called Isandwana in Natal State, King Katsue, the Zulu king, unleashed his Zulu impis and wiped out the entire 24th Regiment of Foot at Isandwana. The colonel formed a square with the remnants of his brigade before he succumbed to the Zulu Asagai. He toasted the white lady from the centre of the square. In 1926, the most important find took place in between the horse chestnut and the yew tree. The road in front of the building had to be widened to take more heavier traffic and they put a herringbone drainage system across the lawns. One of those um, trenches went in between the horse chestnut and the yew tree and there they found the foot of an adult skeleton. Blackburn's CID were brought in and they had a good dig and they said right definitely a murder scene but I don't think we'll catch the culprits. This man has been here for at least 400 years on one of the fingers, they found a huge ring. The ring was taken off, carefully inspected, and inside it had the words Dorothea D. Horton. It was none other than young D. Horton's grave, and that would explain why the White Lady of Sandry will stand over the only grave of the, of the only boy that ever showed her any love, any warmth, and any affection. But Sandry Hall is well worth a visit, Jane. It's well worth a visit. Yeah, I mean, <coughs> that would be a good place to visit. I've got to say, sounds yeah. good. Definitely, I love these stories. So, when you do your tours, um, are they open to everybody? Can every do you have to book up, or is it something people can walk into? Well, um, the tours, of the halls I do, is the halls that actually book me. And um, members of the public, um, certainly at Sandby Hall, they can go there on a Sunday. Um, I do um, one tour a month at Sandby Hall, and the hall will pay me, but it is free for guests. So I do get some very large groups, actually. And there's nothing nice than walking into that building because it is so historic. Uh, what I do love about the building is the priest of, sorry, beg your pardon, is the priest holes. And um, there's one there which is so beautifully made by a chap called Nicholas Owen. And some of Nicholas Owen's work is so good, it hasn't been discovered. And you can pick up the national newspapers and hear of our ladies, um, clean ladies from Land's End, John O'Gross, who've accidentally touched something and a roof has lowered or a, a door's come from nowhere. Uh, Nicholas Owen was using springs, he was using metal slides before they'd even been invented. And uh, some of his work has not been discovered. It's that good, not been discovered. Um, the king heard about him and the king uh, put up a huge ransom for anyone who could catch him and he was chased all over Great Britain and he was captured at a place called Hinlip Hall, Somerset, 1606 and was sent to the Tower of London and the Tower wow Jane, now that's a place to visit what I love about the Tower 
you can go to a place called the, um, excuse the pun, the Bloody Tower. There you will find scratching to the alabaster, um, Anne Boleyn's gorgeous handwriting, Sir Walter Raleigh's beautiful handwriting, Lady Jane Penn. Beneath that, Nicholas Owen. And Nicholas, when he arrived there, he was told, if you just renounce your faith, you can go home. If you become a prophet, you can just go home. But he wouldn't. He was a Catholic to the very, very end. And he died a very, very painful death at the Tower of London in 1606, called Hang, Drawing and Quartering. A very, very evil and barbaric death. But he's, he scratched his name there. And what I love about the Tower is they put perspex over all the graffiti perspex so you can see it you can even touch it but you can't actually physically touch it yeah and yeah. that graffiti is worth it's worth the billions to see Amberlynn's actual handwriting is gorgeous it really is yeah yeah sounds amazing does sound amazing oh yeah oh. yeah we seem to have lost Lorian. i'm not sure why i assume oh, our internet's yeah. gone down or something so Has i do she go for another she go for another drink Probably, <laughs> probably, but I, I don't know. Um, it's entirely up to you how long you want to go, Simon. If you've had enough, we'll finish uh, it there. I'm ready for a glass of Guinness, dear. That sounds lovely. I'm ready Thank for a glass of dear, Jane, but it's been lovely talking to you again. And and it's really a case of me thanking you for um, having me, really, because it's been um, such a boring, boring time just lately. So it's it's nice to... Nice to be able to talk to an audience as well. It's been lovely, really. Thank you. We really, really appreciate you coming on. And we're looking forward to you doing the Jack the Ripper next year with us at some point. Oh, yes. Oh, um, we'll do. That's yeah, a great story. Amazing. Thank you so much for all the ghost stories. I know from everyone that's been in and out of um, the, the Facebook and YouTube, the response has been phenomenal. Um, thank you. Thank you so much to everyone that's come in and from everyone. You are just incredible. And I think you've just made everyone's Christmas a little <laughs> bit more special. So thank you very much, Simon. Um, mm. All that's left to say is thank you to all of our followers who are... Um... That's all right. It's just a message from uh, Lorian. It's all right. Um, thank you to everyone that's popped in. Um, thank you for all your support for Paranormal Voice over the last year. We know it's not been a conventional paranormal year. Um, it hasn't been for Simon either. Um, obviously, COVID has stopped a lot, but we thank you all so much for sticking with us and for coming in on the new podcast that we're doing. To everyone who has joined the podcast, even uh, Simon, uh, Phil Wyman, we've had Richard Felix, and everyone else, thank you so, so much. Um, we just wish you the best Christmas with your family, whatever you're doing, whether it's with family, whether it's not with family. Thank you all so much. And we will see you between Christmas and New Year with Paranormal Fake for a comedy show. It's not going to be serious. It's going to be adults only again. Um, but thank you so, so much. And you've all been amazing. Um, yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much, friend, and our year, Simon. It's been incredible. Joanne, <laughs> thank you very much um it all goes back into the podcast paying for everything uh incredible thank you so so much and simon if you want to i know you've got some tours and stuff coming up next year as you were talking before please do send us some links and we will advertise it for you through paranormal voice uh through some other things that we got coming up next year and through the paranormal voice um facebook group uh just send it all to us and we can put it out to people who hopefully then come and see you because very I think good. you deserve to be seen as the storyteller you are. <laughs> it's incredible. So thank you all so very much. Merry Christmas. And we will see you all very, very soon. <laughs>